Hello chess lovers, I have a mind-blowing game for you played by Robert James Fisher against Robert Byrne. The game was played at 1963-64 US Championship. Byrne had white pieces and he started with d4, knight f6 by Fisher, c4, g6, g3, c6, bishop g2 and d5. Well, if bishop g7, then white can establish a strong center. That's why after bishop g2, we see first d5, c takes d5, c takes d5, knight c3, and only now we see bishop g7, e3, black castles kingside, knight e2, Knight c6, white castles kingside, b6 preparing to develop the last piece and in return white is playing b3. Bishop a6, bishop a3, both players placed their bishops on these active diagonals. Looks like it's hard for either side to introduce an imbalance into this essentially symmetrical variation. But the shocking thing is that in just 10 moves the game will be over. Rook e8, Fischer is unpinning the pawn on e7 and is preparing e5. Queen d2, well, not a good move, it was better to play rook e1, unpin the knight, and if e5 then d takes e5, if knight takes e5 then knight f4 with equal chances. But instead after rook e8 we see queen d2 and here comes e5. Here is what Fischer writes. I was a bit worried about weakening my queen pawn, but felt that the tremendous activity obtained by my minor pieces would permit white no time to exploit it. e6 would probably lead to draw. We see d takes e5, knight takes e5, rook d1, and the knight finds its perfect outpost on d3 square. Queen c2. White is threatening, rook takes d3. Here is what Byrne writes. And as I said, pondering why Fisher would choose such a line, because it was so obviously lost for black, there suddenly came knight takes bishop pawn. Look at this beautiful knight sacrifice on f2 square. This is actually a dazzling move. We see king takes f2, knight g4 check, and after king g1, the knight captures on e3. Queen d2. And a powerful move by Fischer, knight takes g2. Well, actually, it looks like that black should capture on d1, but the thing is that after rook takes d1, it's white who has advantage. But after queen d2, when black is playing this knight takes g2 move, black is just demoralizing white's position and later will start exploiting the weaknesses of the light squares. King takes g2, now comes d4, the knight is protecting the other knight on e2 square and now Fischer tries to remove the defender. We see knight takes d4, but now the bishop moves back, bishop b7 check and this is becoming very dangerous. King f1, well if king g1 then simply bishop takes d4 check and if queen takes d4 then rook e1 check is winning. If rook takes e1, simply queen takes d4, and if a move like king f2, then queen takes d4 check, followed by rook takes a1, and again, black is winning, black is a pawn and an exchange up. Let's go back. After bishop b7 check, we see king f1, and believe it or not, but after queen d7, Robert Byrne resigned. Fischer says he was bitterly disappointed that Byrne did not allow him to play out the full combination. But let's have a look what will happen if, for example, queen f2. Then Fischer was planning to play queen h3 check. If king g1, then here comes a mind-blowing move. Can you find the winning move for black? Ready? Actually, rook e1 is very powerful. The queen can't capture on e1 because of this checkmate. Or if a move like rook takes e1, then bishop takes d4, and again this is winning. The bishop can't be captured because again queen g2 checkmate is coming. That's why as I've already mentioned after queen d7, Bern resigned. 
Here is what Byrne writes about this combination. The culminating combination is of such depth that even at the very moment at which I resigned, both grandmasters were commenting on the play for the spectators in a separate room, believed I had a won game. What a game! This game comes to prove once again how bright was Fisher's brain. Thanks for watching and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave your comments. Good luck.